Advisory services are offered through Creative Financial Designs Incorporated, a registered investment advisor. Securities are offered through CFD Investments Incorporated, a registered broker dealer, member FINRA and SIPC. Christian Wealth Management is not affiliated with the CFD companies. What's up, Dad Hackers? My name is Patrick Antonucci, and I am the host and founder of this podcast and community of Dad Hackers. Dad Hackers is a community of Christian fathers who are devoted to encouraging, equipping, and enabling one another to become the men that God created and designed us to be, so that we can raise up the next generation of fully devoted followers of Christ and leave a legacy of multi-generational faithfulness. Now, on this show, we primarily interview Christian men to dive into their experiences and insights into what it means to be a Christian man, husband, father, and leader. We ask questions that dig deep into the thinking and rationale of these men so that we can all learn and grow into the men that God is calling us to be. I'm so thankful that you've joined us today. Make sure you subscribe to the show so that you never miss any of our episodes. Also, please make sure to leave an honest review in iTunes. Reviews boost the show's ratings, which means that more dads are going to come across our show and benefit from the content that we put out. I wanted to let you know that we also have a free private Facebook group just for Christian dads. So head on over to facebook.com slash groups slash dad hacker and apply to join by answering the three questions when prompted. So that's facebook.com slash groups slash dad hacker. Let's connect in there. Hey Matt, thanks for coming on the show today. How are you doing? Patrick, I am blessed and well. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's an honor. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been a long time coming. I, I, it was months and months ago. It might have even been 2018, the first time you and I chatted. You came and spoke to the Ironman group about biblically responsible investing uh, way back when. And I've wanted to have a podcast with you where we get to dive deep into some of these um, topics and concepts. And um, it's finally happening, man. So I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited here. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great time uh, with the Ironmen. And um, yeah, like I said, really excited to be on the podcast and I think we're going to have a good conversation here. So yeah, let's do yeah, this. Definitely. And I, I think a much needed conversation because just from, from the, the training that you did, I, I learned a whole lot and mm. it's a lot of things that I don't often think about. Um, and are things that, that people should be thinking about, particularly Christian men who are trying to lead their families, trying to be um, righteous and holy and, and set apart from the world. And I think this is one area where, you know, we, we try to devote our finances to the Lord. And I think this is just one more area that we can kind of clean up and, um, and, and hand Absolutely. over to him. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's really picking up steam. Um, you know, it, we'll get into it, but it's, it's a, a worldwide thing. It's not just happening in the States. Um, so uh, we're excited about that. And we, we do believe that it brings God glory. And, um, and that's just yeah. the best part of it. All right. Well, well Matt, why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, where you come from? Uh, a little bit about your family, just so we have a context of who you are and how you got started in this industry. Cool. Yeah, so um, I am a Bay Area native, California, uh, close to San Francisco. actually grew up in San Jose. Um, I've been here pretty much my whole life, with the exception of living four years in northern Nevada. My folks moved up there in the year 2000. So this is home for me, and um, I'm married. I have uh, one son. Uh, wife, my wife's name is Sarah. My son is Justice. We call him JJ. His middle name is Jameson. Um, and we we both grew up in in the South Bay, which is kind of the San Jose area. We made a move recently to um, a, a city not far from there called East Palo Alto. Uh, which, which is just a little bit up the peninsula. And um, we're actually up here um, 
now leading a small home church uh, in our living room. And so, awesome. uh, yeah, it's great. It's uh, such a privilege to do that. And it's part of a network of home churches that's kind of sprinkled throughout uh, the Bay Area uh, between Oakland and San Francisco. And now coming down to the South Bay, we're the furthest, most uh, church in the South. But that's been a really fun um, it's been just a, a blessing for our family. We've been uh, at this church for about a year, but that's kind of the biggest thing that's changed for us uh, recently. And um, it's just been um, really exciting. And we just feel like we're walking in our sweet spot, uh, praying. We were praying for a long time, like, Lord, where do you want to use us? And now I, I feel like we can say that uh, this is where God wants us to be. And it just feels right. And uh, we have a great uh, group of people that we get to surround ourselves with. So. Yeah, it's always um, wonderful when you can walk in community with other people and, and be encouraging to one another, to be supportive of one another, to challenge one another, to hold one another accountable. And um, yes. you can really experience uh, some accelerated growth when yeah. you're in a community like that. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing right now. Just people that really love God, want to grow, uh, want to do life together. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a blessing. So cool, man. Well, that, that sounds like a, a whole nother podcast of, uh, that is, uh, that is, I don't even know why I went on that tangent. You were asking me about financial stuff, but, um, so yeah, as far as, um, you know, the organization that I belong to is called uh, Christian wealth management. I think you'd asked how I got into that. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of got started in finance, um, Kind of on accident, I started working as a bank teller right after high school. So this was back in 2004. Um, and then after banking or working at banks, I got into credit unions. So I've always kind of been in that retail banking um, arena. And, um, you know, I got my degree while I was working in credit unions. And I, I majored in organizational management, which is really broad. Uh, and after 12 years, I kind of looked back and all my experience was in financial services. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I should probably stick this thing out. Uh, but I was getting burnt out on, on the banking thing. So the next logical step was to get licensed. And I got my Series 7, I got my 66, and uh, I actually got a job at MetLife, uh, working in downtown San Jose. And I was doing, you know, financial planning for them. And I was working under a, a senior advisor that was 40 years in the industry, tons of industry knowledge, uh, learned a lot uh, from working with, with this gentleman. But um, there was also some things that were tough. And, you know, he was kind of phasing out of his career and I was trying to build one. And, um, and for other reasons, I just decided that I don't know if I wanted to work for an insurance company for the rest of my life. Um, some of that I'll get into in, in the rest of the podcast here, but just decided I wanted to have my own business and have greater autonomy in the work that I was doing. So, um, I, I had this bunch of guys that I knew that were, some of them went to my church, uh, some of them didn't, and they were all leaving, you know, the wirehouses, like the fidelities and the Ameriprises of the world at the time. And they were going to work for this organization called Christian Wealth Management. And they were really, really passionate about it. And they kept bugging me uh, to join them and to come along uh, into that endeavor. But I was just starting at MetLife and I was just really feeling like that's where God wanted me to be. And so I, I always declined their offer, but I always kind of kept it in the back of my mind. Yeah. Um, and when I started feeling the shift as far as going away from uh, working for an insurance company, they were naturally the first organization that I thought of. So started talking to the recruiter and um, ended up hopping on their team. And basically what we are is we're a fraternity of independent faith-based advisors. And um, our mission is really to bring, we seek to bring God glory in the realm of personal finance. And one of the things that we do in that realm is um, biblically responsible investing, but there's, there's a lot of other areas uh, that we touch on and, you know, just big concepts that we see in the Bible is just, it's not wise to carry debt. So we talk about that with our clients and we really try to help them to get out of debt before they start investing. Uh, and we try to help our clients to see that, um, you know, 
when it comes to money and it comes to any of our possessions, we're just stewards. Mm -hmm. You know, God has entrusted all of us with things on this earth. Some of us have more and some of us have, have less, but regardless of what we have, uh, we're just all called to steward that, um, those resources in a way that brings God glory and, and that really honors him. So uh, we kind of take that mindset, which is completely revolutionary from the way I was looking at it when I worked, you know, as a professional at MetLife. So that part of it, I've really appreciated. And I love the fact that I can um, really integrate uh, my faith into my work now. And that's just like one of the things that just gets me out of bed in the morning where I feel like there's no gap there. And um, I, I feel like that's just what every Christian's, you know, called to do anyway. So, Yeah, man, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, the, the stuff I do with dad hackers, while it's not like this huge lucrative business yet. Um, <laughs> One it, day. It, it, yeah, it is in line with, with my values and my vision for life and, and making an impact. And so even though um, I'm not getting like scads and scads of money for, for doing this by any stretch of the imagination, um, I, I am excited to do it on a consistent, regular basis. You, you mentioned that you are a faith-based independent advisor. What does that mean? Well, if you're independent, that just means that you're, you're not, you know, we say wirehouses, those are like the Fidelities and the Ameriprise and the Schwabs. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you are an advisor, you're either linked to one of them or you're an insurance company. And if you're not one of those two, then you're independent. Okay. So there are, there are lots of independent advisors across the country and there are broker dealers out there because every advisor has to be linked to a broker dealer to kind of dispense the products and services that we sell. And so there are broker dealers that are specifically for advisors that want to be independent. And so that's all that means. Okay. Um, I'm familiar a little bit with the lingo, but I know not everybody is. And when I, sometimes when you hear dependent, you think lone ranger and like, you're just oh, on yeah, your yeah. own handling a whole bunch of people's money and investing it for them. And it's just you and like, that's it. So I, I just wanted to well, make sure that we understood exactly. That, that's a good point. I'm glad that you said that. So, so the products and services are really what people get invested in. I mean, at the end of the day, whether you go to a MetLife, a Fidelity or a Christian Wealth Management, you have to have a level of trust in the person that you're working with because somebody at Fidelity could give you bad advice and sell you an investment that's just not going to work out well for you or it's maybe not what you were expecting. Um, so, you know, in that regard, um, your money is always winding up in the stock market or in, you know, the products and services that, that broker dealers kind of sell or, and, or dispense. But um, I'd say that it's the person uh, that you're putting your trust in, whether they're independent uh, or whether they, you know, work for Fidelity. You really want to trust that person uh, and just believe that they have your best interests in mind. Um, but Christian Wealth Management is a fraternity. I think we have 60 to 70 advisors across the country. So uh, we're pretty well established. We've been around for almost a decade now. We're not going anywhere. Uh, we're really sold out on this mission of, you know, advancing the kingdom uh, in this area. And so, um, yeah, and we work, we help each other uh, because obviously this is not um, something that's, that everybody's pursuing. And so um, we, we just find a lot of strength and unity that we can do it together and we can learn from one another. And so, yeah, I just, I guess I'd say that there are plenty of others, even outside of Christian wealth management that are pursuing um, finance from this kind of perspective. Cool. Well, let's dive into some of the, the particulars of this. What is biblically responsible investing? When we, I, I'm relatively, that's a relatively new piece of terminology for me. I like how it sounds biblically responsible. Anything sounds yeah. good to me. Um, so biblically responsible investing, I can kind of get an, an idea just from that, what it means, but like, what, what's the definition in, in, in how, how, how does that play out? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and it's definitely a loaded question. I'm so glad we're here talking about this, Patrick. Um, yeah. 
let me give you the nutshell version first. Um, biblically responsible investing is all about aligning your dollars with your values. Um, but before I can really flesh that out, I guess I want to um, kind of talk about the problem with the traditional way that we look at investing as Christians. And yeah. I think it'll make a lot more sense to talk about what it is. Uh, so let me just start with a Bible verse that I think will bring some context here. And Jesus said these words, uh, Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, you know, many of us have treasure stored up in our investment accounts, right? Uh, we have mm -hmm. IRAs, we have 401k accounts, we have our, our personal investment accounts. And for most of us, um, that money is held in mutual funds. And mutual funds are investments in the stock market. Tracking with me so far? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So when we invest in the stock market, right, we're counting on the market to grow that money for us so that we can do the things that we want to do, you know, whether it's buy our first home or put our kids through college or retire one day. Um, but what we oftentimes forget, I think, is that being a stockholder actually makes us a company owner. And I want to say, well, say that one more time for our listeners. Being a stockholder actually makes us a company owner. And I would also argue if we're a company owner or if we're talking about mutual funds, we would be the owners of many companies, right? A typical mutual fund could have 100 companies in it. Then we also have an inherent responsibility to know what our companies are doing to turn a profit. And the grim reality kind of of the situation is that many, many of the companies that Christians hold in their accounts, and these are big names that you and I would know of, Patrick, if I just started listing them, but these companies are profiting from uh, the exploitation of human beings through very unbiblical agendas. Um, and these are co corporations and companies that with the click of a mouse, um, you know, you can log into your, your Fidelity account, your Schwab account, and you can purchase these companies on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and then you are now a part owner, albeit a very small part of that company, um, because there's lots and lots of other owners too, but you are an owner. And um, I think that we sometimes miss that just because we're so many layers removed um, from the ultimately what we'll talk about here is the people that are suffering and the people that are being exploited. And so it's easy just to say, okay, yeah, I'm participating in the stock market, but you know, I'm not hurting anybody um, because we would just never see the end result of what's actually happening. But I think if we just look at a microcosm and I want to just go on this a little bit longer because this is really the, the most important part, I think, of understanding this concept because um, it is a rather deep concept and there's many layers to it. But just to kind of take a microcosm of what I'm talking about right now, and I'll ask you a kind of a rhetorical question, Patrick. If you found out that your local corner market was involved in a, a ring of human slavery uh, for the purpose of making pornographic films, would you make an investment into that business? Uh, not. Absolutely, not. <laughs> absolutely not i mean you not only would you not invest you might not even want to do business with them anymore all right 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 okay so you know without naming any names i, I just want to describe some of the companies uh that we as christians can be invested in like right now in our portfolios so there are biotech companies out there that are um right now purchasing and testing on aborted fetal organs and tissues in the name of medical advancement. There are pharmaceutical companies that are manufacturing um, the abortion pill, which in my home state of California, I don't know if you've heard this, uh, will in 2023 be mandatorily requiring public universities uh, to distribute that pill uh, to all of the students on campuses. Wow. Yeah. That's insane. I did insane. not know that. Um, then we have technology companies <clears throat> that are soliciting, asking for, you know, uh, videos, video uploads that um, the content of these videos, it's so disturbing that many of the, the contracted and very low paid, by the way, uh, content moderators 
um, that they have to hire um, to look at this new content being uploaded. Um, these folks have to keep garbage cans uh, right next to them in their cubicles uh, because of the unexpected um, and very disturbing footage that just gets uploaded like all the time. Um, the garbage cans are for vomiting and mm -hmm. you never know when they're gonna see a murder, um, some unspeakable thing done to a child, um, all kinds of just very, very sickening and grotesque things that no human eyes should ever have to see. Um, and you know, these folks, these poor people, oftentimes their careers end with post-traumatic stress syndrome and they need months if not years of psychotherapy and medications uh, just to be normal again and get those haunting images out of their minds. Um, and I'll give you one more example. Uh, media and telecommunication companies. Um, they're making billions and billions of dollars from the sale and the distribution of pornographic uh, content. Um, and your listeners might not know that uh, pornography is closely, very closely linked to the sex trafficking industry. Um, and there's an interesting statistic on, on, on porn, and that is that over half of women in pornographic films admit that the filming actually happened against their will in circumstances best described as human slavery. Wow. So crazy. I wanted to give you, it's graphic stuff, it's, but it's real stuff. And it's just stuff that I, I, I don't want to just um, kind of you know, skim over. And, and we can't pretend like these things aren't happening because they are. And, and real lives are being affected you know, every day. And there's this verse that I want to share. It's Ephesians 5.11. And uh, Paul tells the Ephesian the church in Ephesus, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Yeah. So yeah. that's really the first part of biblically responsible investing. Um, now that we kind of have our eyes opened and we understand the problem, I think that we can proceed with the appropriate changes that have to be made. Uh, but we do call that first step discovery. Um, and really learning and coming to an understanding of, okay, what's actually going on? And is there a problem with the current way that we're doing our investing that will want to motivate us as Christians, as Christian men, uh, to make a change and to do it another way? Yeah, Matt, I, I was thinking of two things um, that, number one, oftentimes people don't know that the companies that they're invested in are involved in these types of practices. Uh, so that's the discovery piece. And the second thing I was thinking was that, you know, when you invest in a company that, you know, I'm sure people that are listening are invested in some of the companies that you were talking about, even though you didn't name them, it, you, you brought up a good point that even though you have a, a very, very small, minute investment in that company, that does make you uh, part owner of that company. And therefore, you are, in a, in a sense, uh, condoning what they're doing or supporting what they're doing by investing in them. And there's some common questions that are going to come up. I don't know if you want to handle some of those now that, that people might bring up about this. Or maybe we can, you want to save those for later on after, after we get through some more of the, um, the, uh, the explanation and, and those things. Yeah, well, I think... Um let's go to them right now. So one of the, one of the things I was thinking of is, you know, if, if I hold to my biblical convictions um, in my, in my values and, and try to um, carry those out in how I invest, there's mm -hmm. probably not, there's not going to be any companies left to invest in. Right. I mean, yeah, I, we do hear that one a lot and uh, it's a good question. Uh, but uh, the good news is there's lots and lots of companies um, that we can still participate in. Um, so let me just give you a couple of statistics on that one. If we just took the total stock market and like every company out there, including international companies, only about 10% of them have the types of violations that wouldn't pass like a biblical screening. No. That leaves 90% of the world of investments uh, just in the stock market open uh, and available uh, for us to participate in. Now that's all companies. Uh, if we're talking about, um, you know, mid to small size companies, 
um, that you would call small and uh, small cap or mid cap, uh, then you know you kind of start to narrow it down. I think you're over well over 50% of those companies uh, we can still participate in. And then if you get to the big, big companies, um, the ones with lots of money, um, the ones that seem to be taking on kind of these agendas and almost personifying people now, uh, the way that they are getting behind certain things, certain movements that we're seeing. Uh, if we were to look at the S&P 500, and if you're familiar or not, that's the 500 largest publicly traded companies uh, in, the st in, in America, about two thirds of those um, have violations. Um, so that still leaves 166 uh, companies to work with. Um, and then there's a whole lot more that aren't the 500 largest that we can still participate that are considered large size uh, companies. So just to bring in some, some perspective there, there's still a lot, a, a world of investments. And I think that the great um, uh, mutual fund companies and um, mutual funds and ETS, which stands for exchange traded fund, kind of like a mutual fund um, that are coming out are just proof of that, uh, that there are more and more uh, faith-based um, fund companies that are putting out mutual funds that accomplish the same things with great performance, uh, with low costs, and they're doing it without, um, you know, without enslaving people, they're doing it without, uh, you know, contributing to the porn industry um, and all these other things that we're trying to stay away from as Christians. Well, that, that's really good news because when you describe all those different types of violations and, and everything, it makes it sound like, oh man, every, every company out there um, is producing violations. And to know that there's, there's companies out there creating mutual funds that are biblically responsible and, and people like you who are advising people how to invest um, seems like it takes a lot of the pain out of it. Cause one of the things my mind immediately goes to is, okay, now I have to research every single company before yeah. I invest in them. And that is just in, in terms of um, what their practices are, do they have right. biblical um, violations? Just that that's another thing that I have to like do to make sure uh, that, that I'm investing my money wisely. So it, it's nice to know that there's products and services out there that kind of handle that piece. Yeah. For, um, yeah. If you're working with an advisor that believes in this concept and has knowledge of it, um, it's not any extra work. Um, and like I said, there's no penalty on the performance side. There's, there's no cost increase on the cost side. Um, and the, the products are already prepackaged for you. So you, you just jump in them like you would buy in the S and P like a S and P 500, um, index fund. Okay. Yeah. That, is, that's really good to know because yeah. I mean, that, that just sounds like a whole mountain of work that, that I may not even know how to climb that mountain. <laughs> and those fun, fun companies aren't just screening it, those companies one time. Um, when, that's going to be a little confusing. The fun companies, right? The, the mutual fund companies aren't just looking at the corporations. They're sticking in their mutual funds once and saying, okay, you pass, you're in. But it's an ongoing screening because companies change all the time. Oh, you know, yeah. they change who, who they're contributing their charitable do donations to and new products and services that they're providing. Um, you know, where their product is being manufactured in a third world country. So those are all things that we want to stay on top of. It's, it's not a one-time deal. And so also take your, you know, we can also take comfort to know uh, that that kind of, um, I guess you'd call it moral auditing is still happening behind the scenes when you participate in these types of uh, funds. Okay. So, okay, so that kind of begs the question then, um, is there kind of like a, a checklist that that these companies are are going through when they're looking to add them to the list of like safe companies. You mentioned um, so many companies. You gave some statistics on different um, companies that have violations. Mm -hmm. So when you when you talk about violation, is there like a list of biblical violations that yeah. that they're testing against, and and maybe what what are some of those? I mean, I'm, I'm sure an exhaustive list might be too long for right now, but yeah, and and not everything is is measurable, so it can be a little difficult 
um, you know, to track some things, but where we've kind of landed, and I say we as kind of somebody that's in this movement of biblically responsible investing, you tend to see the fund companies uh, screening out things uh, like abortion, um, pornography, um, anti-family entertainment, um, LGBT activism, uh, human rights violations, which you could also put in there, the, the sex trafficking industry and human slavery, um, alcohol, tobacco, and gambling. So I think just things that we're seeing scripture as, okay, there's definitely um, either commands that we're not to participate in these things or warnings that these things just aren't wise. Um, you know, and you could take things like the alcohol and the gambling and say, okay, well, I don't have a problem with that. And that's fine. Um, maybe that's not your hot button issue. Uh, but then you've got pornography and abortion. And oftentimes it's the same companies mm -hmm. that are involved in the same type of activities. So um, we just kind of see it as let's just remove anything questionable. And um, but at the end of the day, it's the, the client can choose. The client can choose if there's something that they're really passionate about, not wanting in their portfolio, then, then let's focus on that. Okay. That sounds good. Well, I, I guess like another question that it, it makes me think of is if we kind of extrapolate this concept, then how, let's just say, I'm just going to throw a name out. I, I don't want you to tell me if they're on the list or not, just for example purposes, <laughs> but let's say Walmart was on the list. Now, does that mean I, I can't in an, in a, in a um, way that doesn't violate my conscience, can I still shop at Walmart? I mean, what's the <laughs> difference between investing in Walmart in terms of my portfolio versus spending money at their store? And then, you know, they're providing products and some services through the store that are from yeah. companies. I know there's got to be companies on that list that Walmart has some of their products there. And again, I'm not saying Walmart's on the list or anything like that. I'm just, yeah, you're, you're That's corner it. grocer for, you know, the, the mom and pop <laughs> shop that that's, you know, has products in it. I mean, right. Can I, do I have to stop going there now? Like, where am I going to get my food? <laughs> yeah. Where can I shop? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, it's kind of the boy, the boy, do I have to boycott too? Or is this just an investment? So, you know, we kind of look at investment um, and, I'd say this responsibility of an owner and a consumer as, as there's been a differentiator there because as an owner, I'm responsible for everything that that company does to turn a profit. Right. Uh, but as a consumer, I'm only responsible for the product that I'm purchasing. And maybe I can give you an example here. Yeah. There is a, um, they do a lot of different stuff, but a retailer that not a retailer, they're a, they do uh, biotech, they do pharmaceuticals, and they also do things like baby powder and baby shampoo, right? You might know who I'm talking about by the time I'm done here. So, you know, I've got, I've got a kid and I don't have anything against their shampoo. It's a great product. You know, we use it on, on, on my child. Um, but this particular company also makes uh, abortifacients which are uh, chemicals and products that are used uh, specifically in abortions. I believe they even make the abortion uh, pill. So, um, you know, what if, if I'm an owner of their stock, right, and they're sending me a dividend, right, there's a lot of dividend paying stocks out there, and they're sending me a dividend every quarter or every month, I can't tell them to send me a dividend on their baby shampoo and not their abortifacients. I'm getting a dividend on everything that the company is doing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but when I buy their baby shampoo um, as a consumer, I'm telling them that I want your baby shampoo. I do not want your abortifacients. Um, and so I get to make that differentiation as a consumer there that I can't make um, if I'm an owner of the company. And, and I would say that there's also a case to be made that I'm actually encouraging uh, them to continue to, to do something that's positive in that I like your baby, pro your baby shampoo product. Uh, and I'm telling you that with uh, the currency that is best spoken by businesses everywhere across the world. And that is with my money, <laughs> right? 
And so I'm telling them with my money, I want more of this and I'm not giving them any indication that I want more of that um, on the abortifacient side. So that's just one example uh, that I, we, could, we could look at where I think that there is a, a, a distinction between those two. Yeah, I, I think that's a well-reasoned argument and um, because you do kind of vote with your dollars. Yeah. So, I, I mean, at some point, unless you're like completely off the grid in homesteading, you're going to have to buy something from somebody to sure. sustain your life. <laughs> I mean, sure. it's, it's eventually going to come down to that. And so we, we always, well, not always, but I mean, a lot of times we vote with our dollars. Yeah. We approve with our dollars and, and how we spend them and where we spend them. And that's, that's kind of like the whole concept of boycotting. You, you don't give your dollars to an organization because you're not supporting what they're doing. And, um, I think that's a very well reasoned argument because otherwise you just get in this dilemma of how, how do I even exit my house because right. I might talk to my neighbor who's not a Christian and they have a different worldview and that might influence me. I mean, you could get down that far with this stuff and you know, you could, yeah, you, you could take it to insane. Cut levels. yourself off. <laughs> you could take it to insane levels and it just, it can become, yeah almost unhealthy in a way, you know, um, because right. then you just can't function in society. We are in a sinful world. Uh, that's just where we find ourselves. Right. So um, I think there are some healthy boundaries that we should put on, um, you know, things like investments and things like that. But you know, at the end of the day, it's just like when I'm buying a product or service, I want that product or service. I'm not telling the company I want them to do really well. If I'm buying stock in a company because I want to put my kids through college and buy a home or retire, I want that company to do well. I want that stock to grow so that it's worth more one day mm -hmm. and that I can sell it and I could fund the projects that I want to accomplish, right? But, you know, for me to just go and buy a cup of coffee at, you know, a retail coffee chain, I just, I just want the coffee to be hot and taste good. You know what I mean? Uh, so there's, I think that again, is just a big difference there that we, sh we want to be aware of. So you mentioned that the organization or the fraternity that you're a part of has been around for almost a decade, which, um, you know, decade sounds like a long time, but, but relatively speaking, I mean, it's not that long. Yeah. It, is this a relatively newer concept that biblically responsible investing? Cause I mean, before I, I, I ran into you and, and, and we crossed paths, I hadn't really heard of biblically responsible investing before that. So is it, yeah. is it relatively new? I mean, what, what's the deal with that? Well, um, as far as the mutual funds uh, in the biblically responsible space, those go back to about the 90s. So what are we We're talking about 20, 30 years now? Mm -hmm. um, but the concept, this concept of, of stewarding our money in a way that does not bring pain and suffering to other human beings uh, has been around for thousands of years. And let me just give you a few examples of this. Um, there is a post, a, a, a um, piece that was done in the Christian Post in June of last year uh, by a Jewish rabbi named Lawrence Troster. Um, and this is what he said about uh, the moral responsibility that the Jews had uh, towards the environment and uh, the people that uh, were around them. He says that has long, it has been long recognized in Jewish law that investments make us property owners. In Judaism, property owners have rights, but also many responsibilities about how they utilize their property. These responsibilities include not only preventing immediate harm from occurring to others, but also potential harm. And then if I could offer one more example, I just want to take this sure. to the book, book of Proverbs uh, and to the very first uh, chapter. Uh, if you go to um, uh, Proverbs 1 verses 10 through 19 says, my son, and listen to these words carefully because um, you could miss it. And I'm sure we've read these words before, but listen to this in the context of investment and, and money stewardship. It says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. 
Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, and whole like those who would go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one course. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. And that was, that was the last verse. It takes away the life of its owners. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy. And, you know, I didn't see these verses for a long time. And, and then I started looking at this stuff and I was just like, wow. You know, when I, when I read that verse in, in my mind, like I conjure up images of like walking down the street and this guy jumping out of the bushes, like, Hey, come on with me. Let's go yeah. kill somebody, rob somebody, uh, shed some blood and, and we'll, we'll share our spoils with you. Yeah. But when you, when you read it in the context of our conversation, it's like these companies are out there exploiting people, human trafficking, suffering, human slavery, pornography, abortion, uh, all these blatantly evil sinful practices and they're saying come invest with us and yes. we'll make you money if you support us and then you're going to reap rewards for it financially and i exactly mean that right. that just totally blows that up i mean i'm really glad you you read that i i love when when the word of god is is brought forth and is and is brought alive and alivened um right in the context of what we're talking about it's awesome Matt. yeah yeah. Yep. So, um, on, on a, on a more grand scale, I guess when I, if I choose to do biblically responsible investing, which sounds like the responsible thing to do, um, do my dollars really make a difference? I mean, when, when people choose to do biblically responsible investing, um, what kind of impact does it actually come down to besides just the impact on my portfolio? And, and I do want to get into that, that impact as well to know, is this yeah. you know, going to work out also? <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that raises a great question. You know, I, I talked a lot about the negative screening that we do with BRI. Um, but, you know, there's also a positive um, piece to this too. We don't want to just, leave out the companies that are doing, uh, you know, the, the, the things that are negative. But um, typically what you see is the fund companies are actually looking for companies that are adding benefit uh, to society. And one way to say that is they're adding value instead of extracting value from society. Um, there's this verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 1031, you've probably heard before. It says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. In the U.S. alone, Christians control, and this number is probably bigger now, $6.7 trillion, $6 trillion of assets. Wow. So I'm convinced if every Christian would just put their money where their values were, the abortion industry, the porn industry, the sex trafficking and human slavery industries uh, would shrivel up. I don't know if they would die completely, but they would be a shell of, of what they are today. Um, I can give you a, a, an example, one example, there's many, many success stories about how um, there has just been turnarounds of companies. One of the things that uh, these fund companies are actually doing uh, is that they're leveraging um, all of this money that Christians are putting into the, the, the Christian, the biblically responsible mutual funds. And they're calling on these corporations and letting them know, hey, we have a lot of Christian conservative investors uh, that believe that, you know, investing looks a little different maybe than the way that you guys are doing it. And this specific issue right here, we would love to see if, if maybe you guys would consider doing it a different way. So it's, it's not a threatening thing. It's not a punishment thing. It's saying, hey, we believe that you are a good company and we want to participate in your company. Would you give us the opportunity to do so? And that, that exact uh, case happened um, a number of years ago. There's a case with ExxonMobil 
uh, largest oil conglomerate in, in the world, I believe. But what they were doing is they were giving charitable donations to, a, um, a, the, to this charity that was in, in turn taking the money and buying mosquito nets and distributing them in third world countries in Africa, which is a great cause. And I could see why ExxonMobil wanted to get behind it. But what they also didn't know was that uh, this charity was also, um, or actually they're probably more well-defined as a nonprofit, but they were also distributing abortion kits in these third world countries too. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the biblically responsible fund companies found out about it. They got in touch with the executives at ExxonMobil. Uh, they said, hey, this is what's going on. And it, from what I could tell, the, the, the executives didn't even know what was happening. Uh, but when they found out about it, um, they were pretty quick to make a change. And they stopped giving their donations to that nonprofit. Um, so there's been all kinds of cases like that. And, um, yeah. you know, these corporations have uh, a shareholder um, a phone number where you can call and, you know, they have, you have, they have to have annual meetings, too, for the shareholders to voice their opinions. Uh, so that's part of it, too, that we are making phone calls. We are talking to corporations. We encourage our clients to do the same thing. You know, if you own that company, you might as well let your voice be heard, too. Obviously, this is not something you have to do. Um, but you know, we can get involved and, um, we can change wall street. We can make a difference. Uh, but just the leverage of the dollars alone, it speaks for itself. You know, yeah. uh, they say that money talks and uh, we're seeing that happen, uh, with a number of, uh, great success stories among these, these companies that we've been interacting with. Yeah. It sounds like positive peer pressure, you know, um, Hey, we, we got this mutual fund. We'd love to have your company be a part of it. it, it it's doing well. We have a lot of uh, people hungry to invest, but Hey, you're, you're doing these couple things that we don't agree with. If you were to stop those things and, and show evidence of that, Hey, we'd say, come on in. And, um, Right. Exactly I think right. that's an excellent way to leverage the, the unity of, of the investors there, the, the Christian investors. Yep. So Matt, the other side of, of the question about biblically responsible investing is, is it a fruitful investment financially speaking? I mean, yes, we, we want to support companies that are, that are doing good, that align with our values. And yes, we want to not support companies that are not aligned with our values. But at the end of the day, we're in this, investment game because we're investing we we yeah. want to have a return we want to have a nest egg we want to save up for a house we want to be able to retire we want to be able to you know leave a gift when we leave this earth that's going to keep on giving and we want to be yeah. wise i mean the bible says a, a wise man lays up a treasure for his children's children yeah. right want to do that um, right. Is this gonna? Is this a viable option? And I'm sure you're gonna say yes because this is what you do. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a loaded question in that sense. But I mean, why? Why is it a, a good option in that? In the in, from the financial side of things? Yeah, absolutely. And before I before I talk on this a little bit, I do want to give one verse because um, I think it is a great question. But I also think that it's a uh, it's a secondary question. And here's what I mean. Proverbs 16, 8 says, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. Mm -hmm. So even if as Christians, we had to suffer a little bit on the rate of return, I, even if it gave us no rate of return, but then why would we invest in it? Right. But serious, seriously, it's just like, it's, it's the right thing to do. Great news, right? The, the, the icing on the cake is that, yes, the performance is there too. And so we can still participate. Um, there's been independent third-party research done by uh, the University of Oxford uh, in England and by Biola University in Southern California that show there's no penalty uh, for um, this type of investing. In fact, some of their metrics actually show that there's even a greater potential for gain. Um, and there's also been some interesting uh, press done by um, uh, big news outlets like Bloomberg. They're quoted as saying, perhaps it can even outperform 
the broader index or ESG portfolios? If so, it will attract lots of capital. And ESG is kind of an umbrella over um, something like biblically responsible investing that stands for environmental, social, and governance. So it's a type of investing where we're looking at um, how companies are um, interacting with their stakeholders and how they're treating the environment and things like that. One other quote, the Wall Street Journal is quoted as saying, BRI is a space with enormous potential. So, you know, this is um, something that's turning uh, heads even in the secular uh, space where uh, they're seeing the writing on the wall that not only can this attract a lot of money, uh, but it's going to do it and it's going to do it well. And um, some of the research shows that uh, you'll have more stable performance even uh, because then um, if you're cutting out companies that maybe there's questionable ethics, I mean, a couple examples would be some of the privacy concerns that have happened with tech companies in the recent past where you see massive drop-offs in their stock price in a single day. Uh, we've seen a number of cases of that happening. And then there's auto, uh, automotive manufacturers um, in Europe where we've seen um, evasion of, um, of smog and emissions kind of protocols by the Environmental Protection Agency. And so when those kind of things came out of the bag, again, massive drop off in stock price and the, the share, shareholders uh, basically uh, took the, um, they had to pay for it. They, they, take, they took a brunt, the brunt of that, uh, that uh, decline in return on, in their portfolios and in their investment accounts. So I'm not saying you're gonna have companies that never go down in value, but um, what we've seen is that there can be more stable growth uh, over time uh, because we're looking at companies that are interested in investing for the long term with sustainable practices that sometimes don't have short term massive gains. Uh, but the the performance is clearly there and there's tons and tons of metrics that show it. So that, that's a very good point that you brought up. I mean, typically when we follow God's plan for holiness and morality and follow his commandments, things in general tend to work out better. Yeah. And then if you're investing in companies that that are aligned with those values, maybe they're not Christian values, but they're good ethical companies that have a track record of ethical practices. You're not, you're going to be less likely to run into these, these big downfalls where the company just collapses and, and implodes because of all the, the, the legal issues that have been going on for years and they just finally come uh, to a head. Yep. Exactly. So that, right. that brings me to the question of, so I, Let's say I'm a guy that's invested, but I haven't, I'm just finding out about biblically responsible investing. How do I know what I'm invested in? How do I find out, I guess, let me rephrase that question. How do I find out about the companies that I'm invested in? Like what's the, what's the best way to do yeah. that from this standpoint? Well, um, your, you can always, just look at your statement and it'll show you the, the ticker symbols represent mutual funds or an individual company. Um, so, you know, you can find out exactly uh, what a companies you're invested in just by looking at your statement. And if it's a mutual fund, you may have to plug that into Google and then Google should give you a list of those companies. But if you're wanting to know if those companies had violations or not, there are specific softwares that have been, um, that have been created where, all of that data, um, as far as through like a biblical screening, has already been aggregated. And um, some of those are paid versions, some of them are free. Um, we actually do free moral audits at Christian Wealth Management for anybody that wants to have kind of a, a sneak peek and find out, okay, what is going on in my portfolio and what am I invested in? Um, that's just something that we want to get that information into the hands of investors so that they can make a determination if there's a change that they want to make. So, so finding an advisor um, that's already doing this and that they can do a screening for you. And then there are some free resources online. Uh, there's actually a website you can go to called uh, inspireinsight.com. 
um, www.inspireinsight.com. And that is a free uh, website where you can actually plug in, I think, just about any ticker symbol. And it'll kind of spit out some results for you and show you um, if there are any violations. It'll show you some positive things, too. It's not just negatives. Again, uh, they're looking at good things that companies are doing as well. Right. Yeah. We don't want to fall, fall into that trap of just looking at this as a negative thing, but, but how about yeah. the, the positive side as well? Right. So you mentioned about um, what you do with, with the organization you're involved with. If uh, somebody's listening and they want to um, do some, try to get on track with biblically responsible investing. I mean, I'm sure they could reach out to you and, and you could work out something, but like in, in general, how does one start down the path of um, creating their per portfolio or curtailing it or changing it over to a biblically responsible in investment? Yeah. I mean, I'd say the process is easiest done with an advisor. So if you can find somebody um, that is already in that space, working in that space, they'll make it you know, like a lot easier on you. Um, if you're a do it yourself or uh, I would start with the inspire uh, insight website and I would kind of try to get a, a check on where your current investments are at. So that first step is called discovery and it's just learning about, okay, what's in my portfolio today. And then from there, um, the conversation is not all that different um, from you know, the way any good advisor would be working with um, any of their clients. It's finding out, okay, what is the, the risk tolerance of my client? Um, are they okay being aggressive? Are they more moderate? Um, and what is the time horizon? So are they saving for, you know, retirement that's 25 years away? Or are they trying to buy a house in the next five years? And then that will determine, you know, what kind of mutual funds we want to be using. And um, if you're working with uh, uh, an advisor that believes in biblically responsible investing, then um, the lineup of funds that they're going to be distributing to you will all already be pre-screened. And um, and if you're not, then I would recommend I can give a few of these fund families that people can jump online and check out. But you can go to um, just Google uh, the Timothy plan. Uh, you can check out Eventide funds. Eventide is one word. Uh, you can check out Inspire. Inspire Investing. They do ETFs. Um, they've got five ETFs now. And um, let's see. And then if you're talking bonds, um, you can check out Guidestone, Guidestone Bonds. So there's a, just between those like four fund companies, you're going to have plenty, plenty of funds to use. And there's more funds coming out all the time. Uh, so uh, it's it's a pretty encouraging thing to see that we do have so many options, and um, and again these are all pre-screened. The performance is 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 there, and they're ready to go. But that advisor should help you to make that determination, and if you want to do it yourself, uh, that's fine too. Awesome, man! I, I really appreciate all the all the information there. Well, Matt, we're we're getting up to the end of our time together today, and I just want to say I really appreciate you. Um, sharing with us today. I mean, this, this is a very, very important um, thing that we need to consider that I, I think lots of times we just, it's not on our radar to yeah. think about the ethical practices and the moral practices um, that the companies are involved in that we are investing in. And as Christians in particular, like I said at the beginning, as, as the men, as the leaders in our home, as, as the fathers, we should have our finger on the pulse of where our money is, is going. And so I, I, I thank you Amen. very much for, for the information. And, and I know a lot of eyes are going to be opened as a result of this, man. Yeah. Well, praise God. We're hoping so. Yeah. So if uh, someone wants to, to connect with you, uh, look, at, look into your company, that your, your organization you're involved with, what's the, the best way that they can get in touch? Yeah, I was thinking maybe we could put a link to uh, my LinkedIn page is probably uh, the best way to reach, to reach me. My phone number, my email address, everything 
is there. If you're just listening by podcast, um, maybe I can just share the email address is uh, Matthew with two T's at Christian WM as in wealth management.com. So Matthew at Christian WM.com. Um, I'll throw my phone number out there too, 408-612-6249. Awesome, man. I'll, I'll link all that stuff up in the show notes so you guys can just go there. And Great. On it, man. Awesome. All right, brother. Well, I, I got one final question for you. Does not deal with wealth, but it's a different kind <laughs> of investment. And um, that question Shoot. is, in your opinion, Matt, what makes a great dad? Ooh, what makes a great dad? That is a, that is a great question. We are the Dad Hackers podcast. Uh, I always like to, to try to squeeze that in at the end. Yeah. Well, um, when I think about the best dads ever, I just have to start with our Heavenly Father. Mm. Um, he is the role model for all of us, right? So as much as, as dads as we can look like him, act like him, think like him, love our kids like him, I think that a dad has to be with that, that heavenly father. Um, so I think for dads, um, spending time with God every day, um, to be Christ to your kids and not only to be Christ, but to model what it looks like for, um, for a man of God to, to be with his creator and to make that the primary uh, focus of, of our lives. Kids see that and they need to see it. And so um, I just hope that all the listeners um, and all the, the members of uh, Dad Hackers uh, will just um, be able to say that their kids find them seeking the Lord. Um, and I think that if they do that well, I think everything else works out pretty much in their favor. Um, so I guess that's kind of a, I don't know if that's cheating or a gimme answer, but that's, uh, that's my answer. <laughs> No worries, man. That, that is an excellent answer, and I 100% agree. Well, Matt, thanks again so much for coming on the show, brother. I, I really appreciate it, and um, I'm looking forward to the feedback from our conversation, and uh, you make it a great day, brother. All right, Patrick. Really appreciate the opportunity. Once again, it's been a pleasure, an honor, and uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Sounds good. God bless. Advisory services are offered through Creative Financial Designs Incorporated, a registered investment advisor. Securities are offered through CFD Investments Incorporated, a registered broker dealer. Member FINRA and SIPC, Christian Wealth Management, is not affiliated with the CFD companies. All right, gentlemen, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope our conversation was a blessing to you and that you leave this episode better equipped to be the man and the father God has called and created you to be. If so, then I ask that you please leave us a five-star rating and a quick written review in iTunes. And make sure you head on over to the show notes to get all of the resources for this episode. While you're there, you can take part in our five days to be a better dad challenge, as well as get involved with our free Facebook community. All right, gentlemen, until next week, remember Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Stay sharp.